All right, so let's go back into this idealism materialist. Uh, and I'll try to explain this in the simplest term possible so that everybody understands that everyone is on the same page. Keep in mind, if you are trying to defend materials as an atheist, <laughs> poor pitiful you, still trying to defend the obvious, the, 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 keep in mind, materialism, you need not struggle with this. Why materialism is an arbitrary invention. Once upon a time, long ago, in the days of Descartes, Cartesian dualism separated the world into mind and matter. Mind was always coming back into the picture. Okay? Okay? This, isn't, this doesn't have to be a big, huge struggle if you're an atheist who calls himself a materialist. You just need to know. Materialism fails. Why? It is insufficient to explain the data. And it's really obviously so. Here's the most simplest version I can give you of why. Right now, I'm looking at, in front of me, and I promise you this is true, I'm looking at right now a boogie board. A what? A boogie board. I'm looking at a boogie board. It's a, it's a thing that you use to you know, go boogie boarding in the way. My wife bought it for me for Christmas one year. I forget, a while ago, 2004 or five or something like that. It's yellow. A yellow boogie board is right in front of my face as we speak. Look at something in the room in front of you right now, any sort of material thing, and ask yourself a really important question about it. What color is it? Okay, that's a real question, right? And it has an answer. The boogie board is yellow. Now, let's ask them, according to materialism, that boogie board in front of me, everything that can be known about it, material, materials itself is the ontological primitive. So no other story about that boogie board needs to ever be explored or investigated or asked. Everything about it can be derived from just me knowing enough about its physical properties. That's what materialism postulates. That's what materialism actually is. That's why I said materialism is insufficient to explain the data. Why? Because there's a really important question about that board that's a real question about it that cannot be answered by materialism. And that's, what color is it? This is what Mary's Room is underscoring, and most of you who complain about Mary's Room don't get it. You just don't understand. So I'm trying to simplify it for you. Materialism states the only story about that boogie board that needs to be told is its material properties and its material correlates. Once I break it down to its material structures, I'll know everything there is to know about it. Except, really obviously, what color it is. Why? Because in order to know what color it is, there's nothing intrinsic to the board itself that gives me that information. It is only, and there's no avoiding this, guys. This is the God's honest truth and there is no way out of this. This is just reality. You either get it or you don't. There's no avoiding this. The only way for me to know what color it is, is for me to experience it visually. Look at it. That's the only way I can tell what color it is. And that is not an intrinsic property of the board itself. That is how the light is bouncing off of the board and hitting my eyes. But the only way I can answer that question is by looking at it. So materialism itself is right then and there completely insufficient to explain the data. Why? It doesn't offer sufficient explanatory power. What colors the board can never be derived from its physical properties. Can't be known at all. Why? I have to look at it to tell you. It's all Mary's room is trying to point out. I have to look at it. I have to experience it. So materialism cannot be the ontological primitive, why it's insufficient to explain the data. Consciousness can be. Consciousness is. Now, let's say I'm the idealist. Craig, what color is that board? Yellow. How do you know? I'm looking right at it, and I'm experiencing it as yellow. Am I right? Yes. I can also tell you what the physical properties of the board are. Why? Because it appears in my consciousness too. I can go to the board, in my wind and disassemble it and examine its physical properties. So idealism accounts for both data points, materialism doesn't. Materialism fails. Insufficient to explain the data. That's it. It's gonna it's it's gonna just have to be reconciled too, guys. Materialism is not gonna cut it. Now ultimately I do think there will be a third ism. Again, I've said this before, if the choice is binary between materialism and idealism, idealism wins hands down. Why? Because it offers more explanatory power. There's, no, there's nothing left out so far. 
But I ultimately think there'll be a third thing that is in between materialism and idealism that accounts even more precisely for, for what I see in front of me, which is a boogie board. It's what I actually see in front of me. So that does have material properties. Materialism is right about that. It does have a material properties, and it, you know I can examine it, break, break it down, tinker with it, and examine its material properties, but I can do that as an idealist too. There are only some forms of idealism that get a little too weird and out there and say that board doesn't exist at all unless I'm looking at it. Okay, that's obviously not true. Now, the only thing I've been pointing out with quantum mechanics is that that asks a different question. Where is the board? Well, <laughs> not quite so obvious. <laughs> it's right in front of you, Craig. Well, no, that's where it is in relationship to me. I don't want to go into quantum mechanics again, so I'll just leave it, but I'll leave it, I'll leave that behind. But quantum mechanics is just underscoring the obvious in a different way, and it's doing it differently. Where is the board? That has no real answer. Where is the board in relationship to me? That can be answered. Where is the board, objectively speaking, in the world at large? Particles floating around space. Doesn't really have an answer. So, moving right along. How is this relevant to the Sky Ferry? It's very relevant to the Sky Ferry. Okay, you know how you're an atheist and you say to me, you know, Craig, how can you handle it in church with all this cognitive dissonance? Apparently I'm supposed to have all this cognitive dissonance when I read the Bible. That's, you know, all this, how are you going through all these mental gymnastics? Easy, not a literalist. <laughs> there goes all the mental gymnastics. <laughs> how are you going to take, they're all gone. Wow, that was really hard. <laughs> I swear to God, it's really easy, guys. I promise you it's really easy. I didn't come to Christianity as like, you know, I wasn't raised Christian. I came to Christianity as a 29-year-old man. So it's really easy for me to be agnostic about any single aspect of Christianity that I'm not necessarily sure rocks with reality. Just be agnostic about it. But it says this in the Bible, Craig, okay? Why does it say that? I don't know. Didn't write the Bible, dude. Don't care. <laughs> I mean, they care in some, some interest. But it doesn't create cognitive dissonance. There, will, there is some cognitive dissonance, okay? Materialism fails. That's a given. I just proved it. I'll pre if that's not enough for you, I'll be proving it 50,000 different ways from, free, from now till Sunday in videos to come. It's over. Idealism is the only choice between those two poles, and so far those are the only two options. But the fact that materialism fails, once that gets out there and that starts becoming a really obvious thing in the scientific community and out there at large, materialism has been the dominant idea for something like 150, 200 years. And to some degree, it has imprisoned the mind of the scientific community. That's why they have such a hard time grasping the obvious. That's why they have such a hard time grasping the obvious. The implications of quantum mechanics were right there from the start of the dawn of the quantum era. Now, eventually, Sean Carroll, for example, he's one of the holdouts who's a physicalist materials, will yield. Why? Because it's fairly obvious. Once he yields and a couple other key influencers yield, then that's it. Then that's it. Game over. And, you know, idealism will be the next phase and it will offer enormous explanatory power of its own for the next hundred years or so. It will be the next philosophy that people adopt. Now, as I mentioned, the Bernardo Castro version of idealism adds an extra thing. It is not the one that I'm going to be talking about and using the most. Why? Because it needs to be proved. His version is there is such a thing as mind at large. This big omni-mind thing. And we are all disintended consciousness within this ultra consciousness or something like that. That could be, but that needs to be proved. And he has does have some empirical evidence for it. So you should read his books and check, because he's got some empirical evidence for it, just not enough for anybody to go, yes, it's definitely there, and I definitely agree it's there. But if he does ever prove it, the difference between his mind at large and God Ain't that big. <laughs> really not that big of a stretch. <laughs> really not. If he ever actually proves his postulate case closed because it gets more empirical evidence to back it up, right now it's a metaphysical speculation. Idealism is coming. That's a given. But the one that I'm going to start adopting for my purposes is the conscious realism of Donald Hoffman. Why? It's simpler, far more parsimonious. What do I mean by that? No extra thing is being added. Consciousness is. Everybody agrees with that. Consciousness is the ontological primitive, that could at least be true. 
when I look at my boogie board, okay, I'm not leaving anything out with consciousness as the ontological primitive. I can see it as a set of properties over there that have, you know, that obey certain laws according to science. Fine, fair enough. But I can also tell you what color it is. Why? Because I can look at it and see what color it is. So it has more explanatory power than materialism by far. So it is the next wave. It is the next wave to be adopted by the scientific community en masse. That's how I see it. You can disagree with me, but I just don't see how. <laughs> I don't see what you're going to say. I'm pretty sure that everything I just told you is almost 100% true. Now, the Donald Hoffman version of idealism is much simpler, far more parsimonious. Consciousness is, okay, no arguments there. I am part of a vast intertwined network of conscious agents. No argument there either. You're listening to me right now, you're a conscious agent. They'll call that meta-consciousness. What, what are you listening to me on? YouTube. That is something put there by what? Conscious agents. How'd you learn to talk? Mommy, daddy. Conscious agents taught you how to talk. Or daddy. Or daddy and daddy. <laughs> this is the 80s, Craig. Well, it's not the 80s. This is what I would say to my wife. This is the 90s. And I know it's not the 90s. That's the, that's the joke. Is to say it's the 90s. Ah, never mind. Ah, you got to be there. It's not a funny question. <laughs> Fine, you have to be there. So, I am, I am conscious. Consciousness itself is the ontological primitive that can easily be true. I'm part of a vast network of conscious agents. I haven't added a single thing. I haven't made you stretch or think or go prove it at, at all. Why? Because I haven't added anything. So that can be your starting point really easily. Really easily, without any struggles. Now, let's go back to some of the things I've been talking about a long time ago. Remember at the beginning of these videos, and everyone loved and appreciated my videos on religious experiences. Ding, 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 Religious experiences are coming back. <laughs> why? Because a religious experience is why I became a Christian. A religious experience is what put me in the pew. Remember they say, empty the pews? Well, I went the opposite way. I said, I'm joining him, signing up to the pew. What put me there? A religious experience that I had in the church that was extremely powerful and extremely convincing. Now, if you are an atheist or a non-believer, pull up a seat, not, you know, I got no argument with you. Again, I don't care what you believe. This is just my own, this is my little special thing that I do, my little video. It's got no argument with you. You are free to believe whatever you want. How you act towards me is how I will treat you. If you are cool with me, I'll be cool right back 100 times out of 100, no exceptions. And, out of respect for every non-believer listening to me, I am perfectly willing to tell you my religious experience in purely psychological terms. So if you say, prove that it's God, I say, no, I don't have to. Why? Matter of fact, let's just get rid of that. Why? It's not parsimonious enough. Let's just talk about my religious experiences in purely psychological terms. You all know you have an unconscious mind, right? Okay. Your subconscious mind is a lot more powerful than your conscious mind. It has a lot better memories. It, it tries to protect you. There are all these situations in life, and I had these experiences prior to me becoming Christian, where I, the conscious agent, was able to do and, you know, put two and two together in really, really quick, fast ways that protected me and kept me safe, putting together pieces of information, things that I couldn't consciously know. Your subconscious mind is like a supercomputer. Prayer, even in the secular version of prayer that I'm going to talk about almost completely for the sake of my videos, why? Out of service to you, the atheist. You don't have to believe, I'm not asking you to believe a single thing about the Holy Spirit or God or any of that in order to understand exactly where I'm coming from. You will see I'm telling you nothing but the truth, the God's honest truth. So help me God. So prayer is at least the Christian type of prayer that I'm talking about, a way of slowing down your breathing and getting better in touch with your subconscious mind. That's it. If you say, it's only in your head, Craig, it's only psychological, fine, it's only psychological. The only claim I'm making about it, and I've been making this claim from the beginning, is I can teach anybody listening, anybody listening to me at all, I don't care if you're Aaron Ra, I don't care who you are, I can teach every single solitary person listening to me, no matter what, how to pray effectively, 
You can believe it's just your sub, your unconscious mind the whole time. No supernatural thing need be applied to it. And I can teach you how to amplify that experience so that is a hundred times more vivid and real to you. So that you are experiencing your subconscious mind a lot more directly. A lot more directly. If you're a Christian, this is really easy. And those of you who are the Christian struggle with your faith, you know, it's very simple. Pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. That's a command of the Bible. Yes, it is. Pray without ceasing. Can't be done. Yes, it can. Try it. Those dark nights of the soul that you may be talking about was you agonizing and thinking and agonizing and thinking. Were you praying? No. Oops. <laughs> yeah, oops, yeah, agonizing and thinking, now. oh, what if the, what if they, what the things they did say are correct? What if, what if, I really don't think Jonah did rise from, the, from a whale. I really don't think Jonah lived inside a whale. What am I going to do? Ah! Agony. That's called thinking, agonizing, tossing and turning over the same irrelevant stuff morning, noon, and night. That will produce non-belief in you. What is it not? It's not praying. Pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. That is the command of the Bible. That is the command of the Bible. Your spiritual struggles, quote unquote, begin and end right there. Why? You aren't praying enough. Prayer is like a muscle. It is like when you exercise. And you can talk about this totally psychological terms. I apologize for drifting into Christianese there. I had to say that to the church. Why? Because they've got to get their act together. The struggles that you are going through as a Christian are completely and utterly unnecessary and they are entirely under your control. Start praying and stop agonizing. Why? Peace of God which passes understanding will be yours within a short period of time. And if it doesn't come that day, that means you don't really know how to pray. I literally can start praying and within five minutes feel peace of mind about everything under the sun. Within five minutes, never any exception. Part of it is because I practice. That's why I pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. Part of that is just practice. It's like exercise. And if you ever get into a really good exercise routine, where I did when I was in the best one I ever got into when I was like something like 14 or 15. I was playing hacky sack with my friends after school every day, and I'd walk all over my town everywhere, and I was always hanging out with people, having a good time. And I got a really, really good, and I think I was on the soccer team too. <laughs> there was a couple of like official things I was part of. But I got in really, really, really good shape. Like killer shape. I felt like awesome all the time. Once you stop at working out for like a, a month or two, it's harder to do it. If you have an exercise routine, once you get into a rhythm with your exercise routine, it becomes really easy to do and you enjoy doing it. Prayers the same way. Pray all the time over everything. Constantly. Why? You get better at it. It's like flexing a muscle. You get better at it. You start intuitively understanding it more. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And it is the command of the Bible. All of this agony can be turned off. Why? Just start praying. Just start praying. And if you don't know how to experience the peace of God that day, pick up the cross and try it again the next day. Now choose life. That's what the cross says. It's what it says on the cross right in front of my face right now. I just promise. Now choose life. And then the Bible says you pray about everything and let the peace of God pass and rule your heart. Because once you start praying, that's the very first thing that starts happening when you're good at praying and you can only get good at praying by practicing is you just start unwinding almost immediately. Phew. It feels so much better. I feel so much more peaceful. I feel so much more at peace with the world. Now, that will happen to you even as an atheist. You learn to pray the way I'm telling you to pray, that will happen to you as an atheist, and you don't, you don't have to sign up to any of the Christian, you don't have to sign up to any of the beliefs. Promise. I don't care what you believe, I cannot stress this enough. That was just me talking to Christians. Why? Because I hear them struggle with this stuff all the time. It's unnecessary, guys. Part of that struggle is you. That's it. That's part of the struggle. You're agonizing and thinking and agonizing and thinking and agonizing and thinking. You're not praying. Praying immediately turns that voice down. That voice of, oh, oh, oh can't believe I'm freaking out. Oh, 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 that voice goes away. And you start feeling peaceful. 
And the more you do it, the more you practice, the more you feel connected. And when you start feeling connected, okay, if you're an atheist, that's your subconscious mind that you are connecting to. You start hearing a lot more clearly from your own deepest heart and your own subconscious mind. Okay, I didn't add God in there. I could, but I'm not going to. William Butler Yeats said, I hear it in my deep heart's core. He was talking about one of his famous poems about being at uh, the Lake Isle of Innisfree, I think it's called. I hear it in my deep heart's core. The deepest part of your being you should be experiencing all the time. Even if God doesn't exist, it's your best interest to do that. And prayer helps you do that. It helps you slow down your thoughts. If you're like me, a lot of people are like me. Prior to being Christian, I was an insomniac through the roof. Why? Because I couldn't turn my mind off. Start thinking about something. Ah, agony, agony, existential crisis. Oh, my God, or whatever. Didn't even matter what it was. Thank God I wasn't a Christian then. Why? Because I would have agonized over Christianity, just like all these other people. Oh, I can't believe the Bible says this. What am I going to do? <laughs> I can't believe the Bible says this, and I don't know how to process it. It's all garbage. It's all lies. <laughs> just turn it down. It's just it is voice inside of you that you just need to subdue, turn it down, and get into a peaceful frame of mind. Start getting in touch with yourself and who you are and what you actually believe and what you actually care about. That's all I'm saying prayer does. And I'm saying I can teach anybody how to pray that way so they get more peace of mind, more clarity, more focus. And they start tuning into what I will call their subconscious mind ever more clearly. And then as you practice that and get better at it, there's a science to that. You can amplify your agency detection. The only thing I'm saying is once you get really good at doing that, if you're a Christian, that will start to really feel clearly like God is talking to you, like really clearly, like directly. If you're an atheist, you'll think, wow, I'm really hearing from my subconscious mind. I don't care which one you choose. But don't. Now, let me explain it in real world terms so everybody knows what I'm talking about and we're all on the same page. Uh, reach into your pockets and pull out your tithes. <laughs> pull out your tithes and put them in the offering plate. That is all. I don't know, get the tithe somehow. Once upon a time when I was, uh, I think it was the second time, I was in rehab twice when I was growing up. I think the second time is the one I'm talking about. I went to go visit my friend in Yorktown. I, lived, I grew up in a town called Hastings in Westchester. And I was driving up to me and I'd just gotten out of rehab. And I was listening to the radio on the way there. A song comes on the radio I hadn't heard before by the Chili Peppers. You probably know the song, Soup, the song. I got a bad disease up from my brain is where I bleed. Oh, make my days agree and take away my self-destruction. Okay, when I was driving, I just got out of rehab. That's the first time I ever heard that song. My head almost exploded. My head almost exploded. Why? That song is really specific and it's really obviously about recovery. I got a bad disease. And then he starts basically, it's almost like a prayer of that song. I started having a spiritual experience with that song. Now there no, need not be God involved in that. Okay, that's the meta-consciousness I'm talking about. Anthony Kiedis is a conscious agent. When he was writing that song, he was really obviously talking about recovery. He's been in recovery. So the, the lyrics spoke right directly to my heart. Where I go, I just don't know. I got to, got to take it slow. I, and when I find my peace of mind, I'm gonna keep it till the end of time. Yeah. Spoke right to me. I practically fell out of the car. That's the first time I'd ever heard that song. Now that's your subconscious mind tuning into something for the first time. And it was really powerful in that particular circumstance. Why? Because his, his, the lyrics were obvious about his own struggles with recovery and what he was experiencing. And it spoke right to me. It felt like he was talking directly to me. And here I was driving to my friend's house, you know, to go tell him about after just getting out of rehab. The peace of mind that I'm talking about. 
was what uh, something I desperately craved prior to me being a Christian. That's what I was looking for with alcohol. Alcohol and Valiums were basically the drug of choice and then later on heroin. Why? It chills you out. Calms you down. That, that live wire that my brain can sometimes be even now. I was looking to turn it down. Turn it down. Stop it from gnawing at me all the time. And that's why that lyric spoke to me. When I found my peace of mind, I'm going to keep it till the end of time. And I practically fell out of my car. Now that's meta-consciousness. Okay? Nothing supernatural about anything I just said. Do you understand how that's a spiritual experience? I just mean emotionally connecting to something at the same place where, at the same exact place where Anthony Kiedis was coming from, so it spoke directly to me. You can all understand how that is a spiritual experience. No, no God need to be applied to it necessarily. That's what I'm talking about. Those type of experiences from your subconscious mind, those are some of the most important and when you start experiencing vividly real experiences you can have about being a human being, those are the things you will remember for 15, 20, 30 years. I'll give you another one. When I, was dry, when I uh, got off the plane, I was going to bury my father. I swear to God this is true. Going to bury my father. Now, a Christian in that situation would say that's God speaking directly to you. I wasn't there. I wasn't a Christian at that point. I, I only half believed in God at that point. But it still spoke right to me. That's the meta-consciousness I'm talking about. That need not be explained in anything other. That need not be explained in supernatural terms at all. Still extremely powerful emotional experience. Something that you can dramatically amplify in your life and that will do nothing but serve your interests. It will do nothing but serve you. Make your life richer and more varied and more complex and meaningful. And if you don't want to sign up for, you know, for Christianity proper and believe that Jesus is behind it all, help you knock yourself out. I don't care. Can't stress this enough. I don't care. Don't even know who's listening. Give you another example. Going to bury my father. And for some reason my father's death hit me a thousand times harder than my mother's, possibly because my father... It was, he was a little bit before his time, maybe 20 years. He was, he was fairly young, in his 70s, and he had gotten cancer. So I got off the plane in New York, and at the airport, I swear to God this is true, I start hearing, what did I hear? Um, I'd rather be a sparrow than a snail If I could, if I only could I surely would. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be a hammer than an L. Swear to God, I heard that exact song playing at the freaking airport. Now, why is that so important? Because this that was really, really, really specific. My father, this was back in the days of albums. And my father, I promise you this is true, only had five albums in his album collection. Every single Simon and Garfunkel record. That's it. That's all he had. It's the only albums he owned. He loved the lyrics and he loved Simon and Garfunkel. And when I was a kid, sixth and seventh grade, I started listening to all those albums. I memorized Simon and Garfunkel. I love Simon and Garfunkel. Partially because of that. So those were the only albums he ever had. So I memorized, you know, I would listen to them backwards and forwards. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. I know all the lyrics to almost every song. Um, la 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 I am just a poor boy, though my story's seldom told. I've squandered my resistance. Ah, here they come again. Every time I get going. The cops show up to take me away. He ain't get me this time, copper. So, what's the point? The point is, the subconscious mind, that need not be a supernatural occurrence. But that's a really weird, specific detail, and I heard, I swear to God, I heard Simon and Garfield in the airport. And that song, if you know the lyrics to that particular song, is called El Condor Pasa. It is a, it is a uh, Argentinian or a folk song from Peru that they redo. It sounds like it's talking about my freaking death. A man gets tied up to the ground. 
He gives the world its saddest sound, its saddest sound. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I practically broke down the airport and started crying right there. I swear to God. I swear to God I almost did. Why? Because it sounds like it's, that's when I was a Christian. And I felt like that was God talking directly to me, saying, I am here with you in the deep waters. I am here with you. I see what you're going through, and I do care about you, and I love you. That's what it felt like was God was saying directly to me. Why? Because that's really specific. That's really specific. Now, granted, that could easily be my subconscious mind, and I just happened to notice that it was a Simon and Garfunkel song, and that particular song. Still really trippy and really weird. The only thing I'm telling you is I can teach anybody to amplify that voice. Amplify that subconscious voice so that you are hearing things like that all the time. So that you are experiencing life at a much more rich and emotionally intense version of life than you are presently experiencing. And it will be connected to who you really truly are. The deepest part of who you actually truly are. And when I teach people to do that, I promise you I'm paying a death. 85% of those people are going to think God is speaking directly to them. It's the only claim I'm making. Because that's what it felt like in that moment. You can take that with a grain of salt if you want. You can say that wasn't really God crying. That was a subconscious mind. Fine. Could easily have been just my subconscious mind. Don't care. The difference to me is not that important. And then we used that. I, I insisted that we use that song at the funeral. And that to me was like the most important part of the funeral itself. I mean, hearing that song floored me. Floored me. Subconscious mind, probably. It's at least a subconscious mind. But I honestly, God felt like it was God right there with me. I swear to God, I felt like that was God speaking directly to me. So, they have a kid's that's what I'm going to be going over in the months and years to come. It's not going to be that much different video to video. I'm going to have a couple of key core themes that I'm going to hammer away till everybody understands what time it is and what page I'm on. There's going to be very little room for disagreement. Again, I don't care what you believe. I'd rather be a hammer than a nail. Oof. <clears throat> You go check the song out, El Condor Pass. It's a beautiful song, actually. I'm going to be hammering away on the same themes. Materialism is over. That's a given. Idealism is the only story in town. Both of those things can be explained through the conscious realism called idealism. Both of those things can easily be explained as that me just being in tune with what my meta-consciousness was, was, was experiencing and me noticing. Huge chunk. We're going back to the thing that I said before that people argued with, okay? Maybe atheism, maybe Christianity or theism isn't the default position, but it's a thousand times more common than atheism. And the question is why? Why? Because agency detection is as common as grass. If you aren't hearing things like that, if the subconscious mind isn't speaking to you, you it should be. Why? Because it's your friend and it's there to help you and it's designed to protect you and keep you, keep you safe. And it's smarter and wiser than you, the conscious agent. And if you aren't listening for your subconscious mind, you aren't really paying attention. And you're going to make mistakes and you're going to get hurt. Why? Because that's how life is. Your subconscious mind is on your side and it's trying to protect you. If you don't want to believe that's God, that's perfectly fine with me. The only thing I'm telling you is I can teach everybody listening to me. Every single solitary person listening to me, bar none, even Aaron Ra, how to pray, how to tone down your conscious mind so that you're hearing that subconscious voice more clearly. Then you'll hear it all the time. You'll perceive it everywhere. And you will feel more alive and more emotionally connected to the life you are living. And you'll be more able to discern who's your friend and who's your enemy. What's the right path to take and what isn't? Why? Because your subconscious mind knows this better than you. And it's trying to wake you up and warn you and guide you right. The only thing I'm claiming is once you start doing that, once you start paying attention, a lot of people are going to feel like God's talking directly to them. Why? Because that's exactly what it feels like. It's exactly what it feels like, I promise. That's what it felt like in, in, this, in the first situation. It felt a little bit like that. That's why I almost fell out of the car. It felt like God was talking directly to me about my experience in Rio. Swear to God. 
Second experience, felt like I was talking directly to him. Broke down the airport. Almost broke down the airport. Those type of things happen to me all the freaking time. Why? Because I know how to turn that volume up on that amplification really easily. I know how to take a spiritual experience and amplify it. There's a science to it, a methodology to it. It ain't rocket science. It ain't that complicated. It's really easy to do. And if you're a Christian listening to me and you want more of that, simple. Pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. Stop making excuses and just pray. Period. Why? You get better at it as you do it. And instead of asking for 6,000 stupid things that you don't need and will blow up in your face and you won't use properly, <laughs> give me my house, believe in God for my house, shika blah, blah, blah. Instead of asking for 6,000 stupid things that you don't need, won't use properly, and blow up in your face and won't help you, I believe in God for my car, shika mama mama mama. Ask God for wisdom, period. End of discussion. Just that. Wisdom. That's it. Nothing else you can ask would be more valuable. And just start doing it more often. Praying more often. Praying without ceasing. All that freaking time. Make a constant habit of it. If you have a favorite worship song, you know, let me know. But start listening to it all the time. I'll put some of them up on the thing if I don't get copyrighted. Put some of them up on my channel. It's what I've been intending to do. So, there you have it. That's going to be the main body of what I talk about from now until the end of time. And a lot of people are going to believe me, guys. That's how I see this going. A lot of people are going to believe me. Why? Because I'm telling the God's honest truth. And you don't have to believe me. I um, can't stress that enough. You're an atheist. You're welcome here. I only have two rules for the atheist. Don't eat babies. <laughs> don't eat babies and don't be a douche to me. You can be a douche to whoever. Why? Because I won't even see you doing it. If you're cool with me, I'm cool right back 100 times out of 100. There's never any exception to that. The times you see me quarreling with someone, they chose it. They chose it. They wanted it. They got in my face. They picked the quarrel. That's it. It's the only time you see me quarreling with someone. So, with that, I will wrap up this little golden video. This little video of gold. This video of pure gold, I think. <laughs> you know, I'll let you decide that for Yeah, I really do, actually. Um, yeah, I really honestly do. So I will wrap up this video of pure gold and let you mull on it as you will, let you do with it as you please. As for me and mine, we will serve the Lord. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.